Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 58. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth, and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and perishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you for that reading. Well, as, as uh, oh, I should start by saying, good morning, friends. <laughs> as, is, as is always, it's my pleasure to be here with you. Let's put that down there. Uh, today is the uh, second Sunday of what is traditionally called Eastertide. Now, I don't know, for some of you, that's probably a new term, Eastertide. Um, basically, Eastertide is the, is the traditional church uh, season that runs from Easter uh, to, the, to the Ascension, which comes in 40 days. And it, it's a season which traditionally the church has said to people that they should reflect on the meaning and the results of the passion and the resurrection. Um, and and in, in a sense, it's sort of the, the other side of Lent, the Lenten season. Lenten leading to Easter, Easter tide leading away from it. It's also a time, however, when we can, we can figuratively, if you wish, walk with the disciples as they, they meet now with the resurrected Jesus. And, and, and like them, we can, we can seek to, to fully understand who Jesus truly was and what his mission on earth brought them and brought us because it's so great. At the heart of what Jesus brought for those who believe is a great hope. In, in, in the resurrected Jesus, we are given proof of that hope. So what am I referring to? Listen to these powerful words from Peter, the disciple, and, and, and just imagine him. Now, he's, he's got the chance to, to actually be with the resurrected Jesus. And he, and he says these wonderful words. Praise be to the God and Father of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last times. What, what powerful words those are uh, when you stop and think of them. And, and this is what Peter understood after he had actually seen and talked and walked with the resurrected Jesus. An inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Those are wonderful words. What is there in our world that we would say that that's true of, that would, would, would never perish, 
spoil or fade. I, I can't, personally, I can't think of anything that would be like that. As a matter of fact, in, in science, they have a term called the law of entropy, which is that everything goes from more organized to less organized in our world. In other words, if you buy a car, it's not going to get better over time. It's just going to rust away, right? And, and, and that's basically the point. That's what our world is. It's, it's a place of entropy. But that's not what we are promised. We're promised something that can never, ever, ever rust away that way. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power. And then that wonderful line, until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last times. Jesus, uh, just as Jesus was resurrected, he has promised we too will be. He also promised we would be with him in the Father's house. You know, I think of those wonderful verses uh, in John 14 where it says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, what does he say? He will come back. He will come back. And that's the second, the second time, right? That's the second advent. That's the one we wait for. He will come back and take us because... There are rooms prepared there for us in his father's home. And, and that's the, 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 the completion of it. Jesus who came, who was crucified, will return for us and take us away to be with him in heaven. And my friends, there is the totality of the hope that, that, that we as Christians should live with. Uh, a few seconds ago, you heard the reading from uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, by the way, this chapter is often referred to as, as the resurrection chapter because it's focused on that very issue. Uh, I think you've probably heard the faith chapter is chapter, anybody want to try it? Hebrews 11, right? You know, it starts off with a description of faith. Then there's the famous, what we call the love chapter, which is 1 Corinthians, yeah, you know, where the greatest is love. You, you, you've heard these things. And this is often called the resurrection chapter because it focuses on the resurrection. It's, it's an explanation of how Jesus' resurrection should inform our understanding of our faith. And at the very heart of that chapter, we heard the words, and I love these words. They speak to me, and, and, and they should remain in, 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 our, in our thinking as Christians, uh, where he says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of the eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and perishable, and we will be changed. Is that not a thrilling concept? Does that not just, just sort of reach into you? I don't know about you, but, but I, as I hear those words, those words, I, I, it's, like, it's, it's as though I'm transported to that day that it will come. I feel my spirit rise up within me. My heart thrills to that thought. And this is the beginning of the triumph of hope that was made manifest in Jesus' resurrection. This is now the promise yet to come. And, and that's what I'd like to explore with you a little bit today, this idea of the triumph of a living hope for you and for me in Jesus and in Jesus only. And, and by the way, that's why it's, you know, we can think of it in terms of the living hope because Jesus is alive and he has given a new life to us both figuratively now and in reality here in the future. We will have that new life. Okay, so where do we be begin to understand this hope as we, as, we, as we unpack it? Well, when we read the word hope in the context of the Bible, we have to put aside the usual understandings of, our, of the word in our world, okay? Uh, in Peter's words, as we've read them and in scripture, hope does not mean a wish. You, know, you understand what I mean by a wish or a desire for something that may happen or may not happen in the future. Uh, there's no uncertainty in the hope that Peter or the other writers of the Bible are describing. It is not... You know, I think of the word hope and how you hear it used. I hear people talk about, they buy lottery tickets and they say, I hope they're going to win the lottery, right? What are the chances of that? Uh, well, not great. You know, did you know that a while back I read a survey that said that 50% of Canadians hope that a lottery winnings will help to fund their retirement. I hope that that's not the only thing they're looking at because... If they think lottery winnings are going to, hope to you know, help to fund their retirement, I think they're in for a grave disappointment in this world, wouldn't you say? 
That's one kind of sort of use of hope. It's, it's just not what we're talking about. Here. That's not the kind of thing we're after. Uh, another one that I, I, I in time you, we, we hear the word hope used as meaning something that they hope that they can accomplish something or do something in this world. It's, you know, it's a wish for something. Um, I, I think about years ago when I was uh, worked in high schools, uh, we used to have what are called career days. Uh, I think most of you understand what I mean by that, you know, where you have people come in and talk about jobs and you invite the kids to come and talk to them. And so we would survey the students and we'd say, well, so, so what, you know, before going in, what, what, in order to get some idea who to bring in, they'd say, what do you think you, you know, what's your, what's your hope to be? 50% of the boys in that high school said that they figured that they would be professional athletes playing in the NHL or you know, the like. That's not a hope. That's a fantasy, right? That's, a, that's not real. Uh, we know that's just not going to happen, isn't it? By the way, our world, I, I really get very upset. I should, I, I, sorry, digress a little bit here, but I get really upset when I hear people say, you can be anything you want to be. Well, those boys wanted to be professional players. And they, are they going to be? No, not really. See, that's, that's the way we lead people into false hopes, is with those kinds of things. You can be anything you want to be. Not true. There are a lot of things in this world that you cannot be. I would like to be six foot six. Not going to happen, right? I mean, I mean that's just a fact. So, so, so let's separate those, kind, those kinds of ideas of hope. Wishes, dreams, fantasies. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about the hope in the Bible. That's something quite different. The biblical understanding of hope that Peter is describing is a sure and certain salvation. It is the promise found in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. That's the proof of it, okay? It is the guarantee for you and for me of a home in the presence of the Father one day. That's what our biblical hope is. And, and you know, we, we, we can see this, this reflected. I'll give you an example. We can see reflected in, in many of the verses of the Bible. Uh, for example, uh, Hebrews 11.1. 1, Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. There is no maybe in that. Hope in the biblical sense is real. Uh, our faith and our hope, incidentally, as you can see, are interconnected. We're talking about a hope based on the promise that comes from a, a faithful, immortal, loving God. Yes, we do not see it yet, but we believe it. Uh, by the way, Hebrews 11, I, I don't have it up for you, but, but Hebrews uh, uh, eleven six adds to that, and it says this, without faith it is impossible to please God, because he, to come to him we must have faith, but the, the thing that it adds to it is, we must also recognize that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And this hope is part of our reward. It's part of our reward. Okay, so why is it so important to remind ourselves of this living hope? And that this hope will eventually triumph. There's several reasons. Uh, allow me again to, to, to look at some words. The words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 5. And I'm not going to go into all, a lot of this in detail because I know that you're, you're working on a series in, chapter, uh, in Ephesians and I don't, wanna, I don't want to... to uh, Step on it too much, okay? But, but Paul says this. He says, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. One of the reasons we need to keep our eyes on our hope is because of the world we live in. And we, we prayed about the, the chaos that's in our world. By the way, by the way, uh, when Paul says because the, the days are evil, he, he's writing in connection to, you know, somewhere between the year 55 and 60 AD. That's nearly 2,000 years ago. But that remains the same to this day. The days are evil. All times, all times, the days are evil in some ways. Yes, he was in prison for his faith in Jesus, and, and he and many others like him would be martyred. And yes, the Ephesians that he wrote to lived in a city that was filled with debauchery and evil. But even our times are evil. Uh, we look at things that, that happen around us. Uh, we don't see maybe as much violence in some ways. Not yet, I'm afraid. I think the violence is coming and we're seeing the growth of violence in our world, sadly. 
and, and, and though we may not do physical violence, we're very good at in our world at character assassination, aren't we? We, we? we do that very well. We're experts at character assassination and defrauding people. Uh, a lot of what happens is sadly due to the technology. Well, of course, that's our, that's our world in our time. But we still have wars. People still starve. We still, even though we produce enough food in our world to feed basically everybody, we still have people starving, sad to say. People still do die of diseases for which we have vaccine, vaccines and cures that could help them in our world. The days remain evil. Part of that reason, and now I'm switching to talking about Western culture more than anything, but, or developed world culture, I should say. Part of the reason for that is because I think a lot of people have lost hope in our world. They don't see a future. You see, we have been inundated in recent years, well, the last century, really, by what's called um, uh, existential philosophy. Okay, boy, I, I, should I, get, I could give you a lecture on that, but I don't want to put you to sleep, okay? But it's, the essence of existential philosophy is there is nothing else. There's only this world and what you have here. And therefore, you have to make the best you can of what you have. Well, the problem with that is that if you don't believe there's anything to come, if you only live with in the here and now, then you're going to want to make your life the best you can. And you're going to want to take as much as you can. You're going to want to do as much. In other words, you're going to, it's going to become a very self-centered life. And that's the problem with existential philosophy and thinking. And yet that's what so much of, a, of what we see and we hear is that type of thing. Uh, that, by the way, is, is, the, is the heart and root of, of what's called secular humanism, if you've ever heard that term. We're, we're, we're the, largely the atheist thinking, okay, is that type of thinking. Uh, it's interesting, one of the, one of the great writers of, of, uh, of secular theology, or sec, secular thinking, secular humanism, uh, you know, once said this, he said that, if one is a good existentialist, one is condemned to anguish, abandonment, and despair. This is from the mouths of one of their own people. Because our lives essentially become meaningless and we will end as nothing more than dust. And that's the thinking. Well, why is our hope so important to that? Because it keeps us from that kind of discouragement. It keeps us from that thinking that way. And it hopefully keeps us from becoming part of a world order that treats people as though they're irrelevant. That's one of the major reasons why we have to keep that in our mind. We are not part of that. We live with a hope. We live with a hope. Uh, it's interesting, as I was thinking about this, I, I, I don't know if it, uh, some of you will remember this. Uh, many, many years ago, there was a singer named Peggy Lee. And she sang a song called, Is That All There Is? Anybody remember that song? Is that all there is? Am I the only one? I guess I'm old. What comes in? Um, we don't have time to look at all the words to it, but each of the verses talks about failings that she's lived through in her life. And the, the, this is the chorus that you see in front of you. The, the, that is, is that all there is? Is that all there is? If that's all there is, my friends, then let's keep dancing. Let's break out the booze and have a ball if that's all there is. I don't know if maybe the song begins to, to, to click with some of you. But that's the kind of thinking that unfortunately rules our world in many ways, isn't it? We can't allow ourselves to go there. It's interesting that, that Paul's next statement after the ones that I just read to you a few seconds ago in Ephesians 5 is, but don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. You see that? Break out the booze. Let's have a, you know, and he's saying, no, 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 no. Don't get drunk on wine. That leads to debauchery, okay? And, and he is warning that drunkenness and use of other things as well, we, I don't have time enough to list, the, list them all, often lead to, to debauchery of many sorts, uh, you know, because people are looking for something that will mean something to them, their joy or happiness or something, something that takes away the pain of the world they live in. And so they, they get caught into these kinds of things. And the result is not that things get better. It goes into what we call a death spiral, where it just goes worse and worse and worse. 
So, is there an antidote for this thinking, or have I just depressed you for no reason? Okay. How should we live in this type of world then? Let's allow Paul's words in Roman 8 to inform us. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. We can say that too. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship. We wait eagerly for it. The redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is not hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Keeping our eyes focused on our hope requires patience. But it is the true antidote to the discouragement of the times in which we live. We see what will be, not what is. We see a time when sin is finally defeated, when the world will be rebuilt in the way God originally had intended it to be, with pain and sorrow over. We look to the, to the day when hope finally triumphs. You know, and when I read that, or think of that, I think, can't help but think of the, the words of John in Revelation 21. I'm going to ask you to, to read it with me, okay? And this is what he said. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. What a wonderful promise that is, isn't it? And that's why we have joy. It's partly because of that. And I want you to continue to read with me, okay? I want you to continue to read with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, verse 15. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Ready? Here it comes. Therefore, encourage one, oh, sorry, uh, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words. How can we not encourage with these words? You know, for me, when I read these words, I think it, 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 it just, it, again, as I said, it thrills my heart, but it also says to me to, 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 to tell other people, you know, this is, this is our hope. This is our hope. No matter what happens, whether I live or die, I will hear the trumpet call. We will hear the trumpet call. And we will be raptured. And we will live eternally in the presence of our God. That, my friends, is the triumph of hope. And that's the hope that came with Jesus to this world for us. Keeping our eyes on our hope also in inspires me to perseverance. Even when life is hard, and it often is. We know being a Christian, just as in Paul's day, is an invitation to, to attack. It's an invitation to persecution, and, and maybe even for some people to martyrdom. Uh, I don't know if you know about it, but those who track martyrdom in the world say that there are more people who were martyred in, in, from the year 1900, basically the 20th century to the present, than were ever martyred in the past, the totality of it. There, there are people being martyred for, for, for confessing Jesus right now in this world. So how do we persevere in this, this kind of a world, in this time of difficulty, and those who would attack us? We trust God. 
and to keep guys to keep our eyes on our hope. That's what it is. That's our hope. Again, the words from Romans 8. You can continue reading with me. For I am convinced that suffering we now endure bears no comparison to the splendor yet unrevealed which waits in store for us. Do you believe that? You should. You should. It's an understanding based on our hope that should carry us past the hard times. That's the triumph of hope. A splendor yet unrevealed which waits in store for us. If you've heard me speak before, and I think many of you have, then you, you know that I would eventually come back to a topic uh, that is near to my heart, and that's the worship of God. You see, our hope has to be part of our worship too. It has to, be, it has to, to uh, inform our worship. Why? Well, worship is praising God for what he has done, what he's doing, and what he will do. What he will do. And our hope is connected to all three. He's, he did send Jesus to live and die and live again so that we would have hope. That's the past. That hope helps us in our lives today. That's the present. And one day our hope will be made real by God in the future. And that is the future. So our, at all aspects of our worship should reflect to some degree in, in our hope. Not just music, and I know that there's, that, there's that, that false thinking that worship is music in some churches. But, that, but it's not. It's much more than that. It should be part of our prayers. Actually, we did hear it in our prayers this morning. We did hear it. Uh, you know, I cannot help but think of Jesus' instruction prayers. He told us to pray. What, what did he say to us? He said, pray, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. It should be part of our prayers that we pray that God's kingdom will come, that his will will be done on earth as well as in heaven. But that's a reference to the fact that there is a will in heaven that needs to be brought here as well. So in our prayers, uh, we should give thanks to God for everything, including thanking God for what he has done, is doing, and will do. We should be thanking him in our prayers for those things. I, I, I know that when I, when I, try, to, I try to reference the whole regularly in my messages because I think it's so important and I often will bring this, this, this up in my messages that's part of worship isn't it because a message is part of worship I know you'd rather listen to music probably than me but you know but the fact is it is part of worship but our music especially should reflect our hope and one of the things I love by the way about many of the hymns of the past uh, is that they often had a verse praising God and talking about the hope specifically and celebrating our hope when the day will be with God. Um, I have a couple of them just to give you some examples of, of it and, and <clears throat> see, if I've got, see if I've got the voice for it. You can, turn. you can join me incidentally, okay? The words will be up here. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory you want the chorus victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. And that's very typical of the hymns of the past. Uh, some whole hymns are that way. Um, uh, Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. 
When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. By the way, uh, I still have time, huh? Okay. Years ago, I, we, I put a song in it's out of the older songs into one of the services, and one of the young ladies that was singing in our worship team was very upset. She said, why would you sing a song about death? And I said, well, it's not about death. It's about what we're getting, where we're going. And the song that she was singing is, is, is one that I, that I really, is one of my favorites in any way. Some glad, some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh jory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. So what does that do for you? Does that not cause you to lift your eyes? It should. That's where our hope is. That's where our hope is. Some modern songs have that too. I shouldn't say it's not old. Just some modern songs, uh, some of the, the really good modern writers have, have, have included some too. Uh, let's see if I, can, if I can do it for you. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. 10,000 years and then forevermore. Still there. <laughs> Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Yeah. Exactly. And you see what you're doing? Bless the Lord on my soul. You see, we're reminding our own souls, aren't we? That this is our hope. How, how could it get better than that in some ways? Uh, there's one that, that you, you, you did it when, when the last time I was here called What's He Done? What He's Done. And the same thing. What He's Done, What He's Done. All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. How can we not sing and make music in our hearts? You know, it, how can we not be thankful to God? You know, uh, as one hymn writer said, uh, for our blessings today and our bright hope for tomorrow. Okay, that's from another hymn, of course. I'd like to finish with one last portion of scripture from Revelation 22, and this is what it says. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will seek his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord their God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. You know, as much as we've talked about the hope, I've got to point out that there might be some among us who aren't really sure about that living hope, or that they have it. Maybe they feel that they don't really know Jesus. Maybe they don't really grasp that Jesus that we talk about in Easter. If you're one of those people, please, please, accept our invitation to speak to us. Speak to the pastors. Speak to the elders. Find somebody. This hope is so wonderful. You don't want to pass it by. And it's available to everyone who would ask for it. Don't let the time come when that trumpet sounds. You're not ready. Be ready for it. In the end, in the end, 
because of Jesus, we look forward to the day when our triumph of hope will be complete. Will be complete. Allow me to pray for you, please. Father, these are your children of the family of God here. As we come together to, to, to praise you for what you've done, to be, remember what, what, is, what, what you've already accomplished. And we thank you for all of that. But we also know that we wait. We wait for the day to you, for you to complete this. And as, as whatever time it takes, it's your will. We leave it in your hands. We know that you don't want people to perish. We know that you want people to come to you. And so we thank you that you have shown us at least. And we pray that you would show many others of this wonderful hope that we have. And then one day we will stand before you and we will praise you face to face. And we thank you for that, that great hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.